Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Black land matters. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, we take a look at the way 19th century African Americans bought land in order to win things like votes and safety. And then we take a look at a few initiatives to do that again today. Welcome to our program. What's the connection between democracy and land? The history of the USA is packed with people of color and poor people who've been stripped of their rights to vote, to wages, to housing, or even just the right to stay in the country through incarceration, segregation, slavery, and deportation. For just as long, black communities have created safety and won a say in democracy through buying and keeping black land cooperatively. It's not just history, either. Mark Scott is an organizer of Black Land Matters, a group working in New York today. And Tia Powell Harris is the director of the Weeksville Heritage Center, Brooklyn's largest African-American cultural institution, which is dedicated to preserving the history of the 19th century African-American community of Weeksville, one of this country's first free black communities. Mark and Tia, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you. Glad so tell here. me about Weeksville. I, I didn't know about it. A lot of people don't, and that's okay, the good. problem. So let me tell the story. Yeah. Um, in 1838, James Weeks purchased land in what we now call Crown Heights, Brooklyn. And he wasn't the first African American to purchase land, but the difference is he purchased that land to intentionally build a community. And remind us of the, the world of, of James Eight, Weeks in 1838? That's right, 1838, just 11 years after the abolition of slavery in New York not to speak of the rest of the country, mm -hmm. pre-Civil War, mm -hmm. Civil War, 1865. And black so life in New York was? early on. Difficult. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. New York wasn't very nice to African Americans in 1838 sure. or before. Um, but Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights, Brooklyn, um, served as uh, a sanctuary, mm -hmm. a safe haven for free people of color in 1838 who desired that sanctuary and to own land because they could purchase land and if the land was valued at two hundred and fifty dollars they were also afforded the right to vote because that was the time when the right to vote was tied to being a landowner Absolutely. tied to being male and white Absolutely. but being a landowner yeah, you could overcome right. the racial barrier by owning the to land to some extent by owning land so you you well black males had to pay right. 250 dollars mm -hmm. in order to be afforded the right to vote uh, white males did not oh. right. so it's still difficult sanctuary but a difficult sanctuary so weeksville came into being mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. was it like at its height there were about 500 residents in this 16 block area in, in Crown Heights. And because these visionaries, these activists were community builders, they knew that they had to also self-sustain. Mm -hmm. So they built churches, they built schools, they had an asylum, they had an orphanage, they had an African civilization society, they even had um, a newspaper and a baseball team. So this was a fully self-sustaining community of, of visionaries, activists, because they were very activists, uh, active in um, abolition. They cared mm -hmm. about the freedom um, of others. Um, and they did well. They did, they did very, <clears throat> very, very well. Lots of influential folks were residents of Weeksville. Uh, but then Brooklyn kind of grew up and around this area of Weeksville and kind of uh, subsumed it, right? The redrawing of the grid lines, et cetera, um, the development of, of public housing. Um, so historic Weeksville was, was pretty much lost, except for four little shacks on what they call historic Hunterfly Road. Um, and I get to this part of the story because because it returns to the notion of community and collaboration and working together and unity and demanding, mm -hmm. a people demanding something. Um, because these, these four shacks existed um, until the late 1960s when a group of folks uh, taking a class, a neighborhood history class at Pratt Institute, decided to try to find them. Well, we wonder if they're still out there. 
And that was important in the 1960s because contextually, you've got the Black Power Movement, mm -hmm. you've got the Black Arts Movement, mm -hmm. you've got a, a race of people who are again demanding validity in this story that and is black America. Black studies in the academies, exactly. including exactly. that. So let's find our history. Let's find it. Let's preserve it. Let's dig it up. That's exactly what these folks led. The community came to bear on saving these houses and demanded that they be deemed historic landmarks because what they knew was that the story of Weeksville mm. once preserved had the potential to inspire and empower mm. generations to come. In terms of today, I'd love you to draw the parallels because this is a contested frontier of gentrification in New York City Absolutely. right now, kind of holding on there. Um, but what is the situation today? Because a lot of people would say, well, today is very different. People, blacks can vote, they can own land. We've certainly had successful black communities in yeah. Brooklyn for years. Why do they need something like Black Land Matters? And what is Black Land Matters? Well, really? from our perspective, um, I would say Black Land Matters is about um, creating a process of stewardship for black folks for when you do own land um, that you have a connectivity to that land in terms of uh, the land can actually uh, work for you. Um, it can produce for you. Uh, how do you become productive in the terms of uh, in a society where we live in food deserts? Uh, food security is an issue um, for us in Crown Heights, Bed-Stuy, Central Brooklyn. Um, in these time frames, we now have um, a lot of a lot of lots that are being turned into community farms, mm -hmm. um, but obviously they're, they're not producing to the level that they need to to be able to sustain a full community. So we, we at Black Land Matters, um, we feel like we need to um, use the expertise that people like Tia and Weeksville have um, to show the history of, that this is not new to us uh, and, and teach us how to keep land um, so a secession plan, how do you actually keep land for longer um, than one to two generations? Mm -hmm. Because that now is what you're talking about in terms of the battle lines that are being drawn um, because the, the, um, the prospectors are here, they're, they're coming in, they're, they're extracting the value from the land in, in, in many ways. Right? Well, so how do you keep the, the, the value? How do you keep the value and the secession at the same time? Because value can't be allowed to rise too high if you want to keep peop keep it affordable. Well, can't be allowed to. That's that's a that's a very loaded piece right there. Um, the the idea is in terms of what Tia was saying in terms of the value comes not from the individual. What one can do is far less than what the aggregate can do. So how does it work? Pooling uh, resources together and then uh, creating a relationship, a cooperative relationship. Um, or a governance structure to one share, one vote. And um, teaching ourselves, going through a process where your, your time is important, um, your labor that you put in to the governance and structure of the organization is important, and then the vetting of the actual property or the land, going out to do that due diligence, that's a learning process that we go through. And once you do get the land, um, doing a design, a sustainable design for that land. Have you got land at, at present? Yeah. So, um, you know, historically for black folks, uh, you know, safety in numbers, right? So one of the things we looked at was, you know, all the barriers to entry in a, uh, an environment like Brooklyn and central Brooklyn uh, through, the, through the banking crisis. We stepped out and looked for other uh, black and brown African diaspora communities that were going through some of the same challenges that we were going through. What'd you find? And we found Costa Rica. We found the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica with um, a group of uh, ex-Caribbean, uh, Jamaican, uh, mostly, but there are some Cuban uh, workers in the late 1800s that left Jamaica um, and went into Costa Rica to help build the railroad from Limon into San Jose. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that happened was the, the project overran. Um, so the government of Costa Rica started uh, paying the workers with land. Mm -hmm. So they ended up staying and um, a, a land 
you know, mass the size, I guess, maybe about uh, two to 300 miles wide from um, the mountains to the coast and then from the border of Nicaragua all the way down to Panama. And how does that help you? We found black and brown folks that were going through the same, what we call gentrification here. Um, there, uh, they, they had the Chinese that were coming uh, in to, for free, build infrastructure and bringing in development and that development wasn't being, uh, the value that was mm -hmm. being extracted from that development wasn't being shared with the indigenous or the Africans that were there. Yeah. So we said, what can we do? We partnered with um, the cultural organization in the community, the African Caribbean Museum. They said that what we need is um, a channel to a market of black and brown people who want to come here and participate in the ecotourism. Uh -huh. right? So I hear a, an international connection, a sort of sustaining exactly. relationship north-south. Yep. I hear a cooperative management and investment in land in a contested area in the States, it's in the States, in New York City. Right. What would James Weeks think of all of this? Well, and then I have another question for you see, before we I think close. It's, I think that what the young people <laughs> are doing <laughs> is is incredible because actually I mean the the slice of life here is here's here's a young man who learned his history who was empowered by it who took the ideas of a local situation and turned it in today's world into a global perspective and the trick might be that that's the only way to yeah. do it so he kind of he kind of drilled through um, to a bigger vision. Mm. So I think Mr. Weeks would be, would be proud. very happy. Now I my question that registered happen. earlier, but I wanted to ask you now is when you described the institutions in Weeksville, mm -hmm. there was an asylum, but I didn't hear anything about police. Mm. Oh, that's a police that's Weeksville. You got me on that. Did you know? No, because no. I've never read anything about. No, I've never Maybe they read figured out some way to the manage their society right. without police. What do you think? Right. And how do you right. see the relationship to Black Lives Matter? So, from a Black Lives Matters perspective, uh, I go back to one of your earlier guests, um, uh, Ms. Nemhard, Jessica, Gordon, Jessica Nemhard. Gordon Nemhard, who has uh, made the correlation between um, the social movements that have happened uh, for Black people in this country and the correlation between uh, financial cooperative financial movements in the country in that there's always been a backstory of mm. cooperative financial movements behind those social movements and so in that vein we said well Black Lives Matter is, is definitely what is holding the attention of the country and the attention of the world right now so if we can uh, start to uh, formalize a vision and a goal and a strategy around the cooperative piece and how we feel cooperatively we could actually um, make that movement kind of mm. galvanize then you know we'd be doing the work correctly mm. and then Black Land Matters is what came out of that and I felt like it was important because from a governance perspective it's it's important for each locale to actually be able to use um, the conditions of their their specific locale to govern, right? So that lends mm -hmm. itself to that cooperative movement. A cooperative relationship amongst movements. There you go. Thank you both. <laughs> it's great hearing from you. If people want to find out more about the Weeksville Heritage, uh, Heritage Center, they can do it at your website that we'll put a link to at ours. And if you want to see for yourself our interview with Jessica Gordon Nempart on solidarity economics in the black community over the history of this country, check it out on our website. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. New York City made history not so long ago when the council passed new funds for cultivating cooperative businesses. Some of those are now well in the works. We went out to take a look at how things were progressing. The Northeast Brooklyn Housing Development Corporation started about 30 years ago. Uh, we're mostly a low-income housing developer, manager, and owner throughout four neighborhoods in Northeast Brooklyn. We have a whole community programs department that works on tenant services, but then we've also been running a food pantry for about 20 years. And we've recently converted that food pantry 
uh, to a client choice food pantry, which is located downstairs. Two years ago, I was brought on um, to design and manage a program called Communities for Healthy Food. So we did a community scan, a needs assessment of the neighborhood, tried to understand who was doing the good work around food, what work still needed to be done, what our resources were that we could throw in. And we really asked the question, well, what's going on with food here? You know, there are parts of the community that feel hopeless in a way. You know, like they're like, oh, there's all these changes happening, there are a lot of new people coming in to Brooklyn, into Bed-Stuy, and they feel a little lost. What we found through talking to neighborhood residents and our community partners was that good food is here in, in Bed-Stuy. Despite some people calling it a, a food desert, it's really not. What's going on here is that a lot of good food is coming into the neighborhood along with this wave of gentrification. But just like the housing, it's too expensive for the people who have lived in this neighborhood for a long time. So our solution to that is to design programming that creates jobs, so puts more money into people's pockets so that it, they can afford the good food that's in the neighborhood and also drive down cost of food in the neighborhood. We uh, own and operate a local grocery store in bed called bed Fresh and Local. We made an effort to hire youth from the neighborhood and um, have worked with uh, uh, Exalt, which is like an internship program for like youth that have had run-ins with the law and stuff. And, um, we've gotten some of our like best employees like through those programs. And, um, you know, before the store, I've called Betsy home for like many years. But with the store, I'm like really proud. We're part of a project to uh, start a Central Brooklyn food co-op. Uh, we've also brought in a farmers market into the neighborhood directly that directly serves low-income people. Um, and we're working with bodegas, a couple of bodegas that are our tenants, actually, uh, to increase their healthy food options. So that's some of the ways that we're like trying to make food a little bit more affordable for folks. And then on the other side, we're also, we have a whole community chef training program. So for all of our culinary courses, they're led by members of the community. And we've trained them and we pay them well for their work. Um, and then the final piece is this, uh, is this cooperative business project. And that is where I kind of lay most of my hope for, for change in this neighborhood. By working with the working world, we can really change the economy of this neighborhood. There's a prejudice in the market even against cooperatives. The idea that people can actually be democratic and get along and make decisions together somehow is seen as um, it's, it, it's sort of radical and that, that, that can't be true and um, dangerous. And to face that kind of prejudice already, uh, to have the few resources they had to bear and to have gotten to the places the business have gotten, it certainly makes me convinced we should keep working at this. So many people are talking about bringing supermarkets into the neighborhood. And I keep asking the question, well, what kind of jobs are supermarkets creating? Eight dollar an hour jobs? How is that changing the nature of this neighborhood at all? Um, so what we want to see is cooperatively owned supermarkets or cooperatively owned businesses in some way and that can actually completely change the landscape of what's happening here. We heard about these uh, workshops from NEPCO, I don't know, a couple months ago and we were so excited and I remember coming to the first meeting and you weren't able to come with us or with me and I remember coming home from the first meeting and being like, oh my god, we have to do this, like this is so <laughs> exciting because when we actually were planning the business, uh, we had thought about opening as a co-op, but we just d couldn't really get our heads around the concept. Um, so this was really exciting. We want to start a bed Cooperative Council that is led by the people who are starting the businesses and also people who are leaders in bed um, to really come in onto, onto the project. Um, and so, you know, we'll start these, hopefully start a few businesses to get going, and then hopefully those businesses will be paying back those loans, and we'll grow the revolving loan fund, and we'll start more businesses, and and have a you know, good cooperative going here. So general certification is that it's electrical, but there are other ones as well that you can... I'm a local three electrician at top grade, and as long as I work for other people, I won't be able to be financially dependent because my job depends on whether there is work or if someone wants to keep me employed, and I have other goals, such as starting my own business. I'm a um, certified pesticide applicator, and I want to establish a business that is a worker cooperative for pesticide applicators. A business is a really, is a concept everybody can understand, but when you throw the word cooperative in there, a lot of people don't understand what it is. So when we 
were going to you know approach doing outreach for this we just had no idea if people were going to be receptive to it at all um, and so we decided to pilot the program by doing three introductory workshops and they would all be essentially uh, co-op 101 and we really thought we would maybe get at most 12 participants registered for this class we now have I think 37 registered for this class so there's clearly a lot of like desire for this here. I know that a lot of businesses or individual owners can't always maintain their businesses because they don't always have the classes or the knowledge or so that's why I feel like something like this, this class, this workshop is really great because it breaks it down into you know kind of layman terms and the staff is really open and friendly and um, there are a number of people that kind of give you um, their own perspectives on how to approach a co-op so I think that's beneficial. The details of um, running a co-op and establishing a co-op are um, more um, intricate than I thought they were. Um, and an appreciation for the human dynamic that's involved is also something that the class points out. Um, decisions that, that a person could make in a the, in the, uh, privately owned business will probably take a lot longer in a cooperative. But I think that um, the energy that comes out of a cooperative would be much, much greater. Honestly, this is the first time I've ever even heard of a worker on a cooperative. And we're eight weeks in, and it's very interesting where I believe that all workers will have more incentive to work harder because they own it. So more of the profits go back to ourselves. It builds a community as far as bringing employment into communities. And I'm a member of the community, as well as my son. So I would love to see it thrive which would give me more incentive to live here as opposed to move upstate in five years. <laughs> After the success of our first attempts at doing a cooperative academy in the Rockaways, we decided to double down on the strategy of doing really uh, place-based at the level of a neighborhood kind of um, economic activity, locally controlled, community controlled, worker controlled economic activity. Uh, we found it very successful to bring people together as a group of peers, um, help them set up a local cooperative council to have a, a, a repository, a place to start building um, the, the experience, the memory of all the skills it takes to build business, kind of rediscover that process of how people can be successfully productive. Um, and we really see it as a really powerful way to have communities not only come together, but to actually have act, true economic power as a community. What the cooperative does, and what this workshop does specifically in breaking down what a cooperative does, um, is empowers people. Given the, the city council funding that the collective of uh, co-op organizations got last year, including the working world, I think there's support there. I think the de Blasio administration, a lot of people that I've met in the city council are excited about co-op cooperatives, and I think there's a lot of growing interest in that too. So I think if we build it, uh, they will fund. bed absolutely has everything, all the ingredients to make a vibrant community of cooperatives. I'm really excited about um, building here. and. I think it can be a great example to lead the way for other communities to do the same. As you know, America as a country, as the world has been changing, as the economy has changed, as the culture has changed, um, people are looking for or need more alternatives. The cooperative is a, is a very good alternative. It empowers everybody involved in it and it doesn't um, leave decisions in the hands of um, one small group of people. Um, and I think that it, it, it values work. We need good jobs. We need jobs where we can make decisions on our own. Um, and I think that resonated with people big time. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, 
are worker-owned co-ops the basis for a more democratic economy, not to mention society? They certainly could be part of it. Here's what we came up with, our special report on the change. People realize that their whole lives they haven't been practicing democracy. Democracy isn't something that you do once every four years. Democracy is something you have to do every day. I knew what Katrina did here was a result of a natural disaster. What I saw out there was a man-made disaster. Katrina gave uh, the government ammunition to tear down something that they had been planning uh, for years and years to get rid of, which is public housing. The local people are being pushed out of work, pushed out of housing, pushed into poverty. What we have to look at is the refusal to acknowledge race. <laughs> 